for County John Doe, identified as William Joseph Lewis. William Joseph Lewis was 19 the day that everything fell apart. He went by the name Bill, but even that wasn't known for nearly four decades. Instead, what we knew about him came from the man who took his life, but the very basic human decency of his identity was stripped away on November 20th, 1982. We know now that Bill was missing from Peru, Indiana, and he eventually became a John Doe in Jasper County, Indiana in 1982, which is only about 70 miles from his home base of Peru. A man was out that day setting fox traps in Jasper County when instead he discovered Bill, who authorities believe had been there for a while. They knew more about who took Bill's life than they ever did about Bill himself. The basics known about Bill was that he had brownish red hair, he had previously broken his left leg, his Zippo cigarette lighter said Arlene on it, and he wore a size 11 and a half shoe, which is slightly above average for the time. On the flip side, the man who took his life Larry Eiler killed over 20 young men in just two years, from 1982 to 1984, throughout Indiana and Illinois. For this, he obtained undeserved notoriety, which is why I try to give as little attention to serials on this channel as I can. The degenerate Larry Eiler was eventually incarcerated for his crimes, and he passed away in 1984 from AIDS-related complications. His M.O. remained pretty consistent, and he confessed, saying that he picked him up hitchhiking along Route 41. They drank some beer, and they took some drugs together. Unbeknownst to Bill, he purposely gave him a drug to knock him out. When the men would come to, they would be bound and subject to various types of assault before he would take their life. He was on death row when AIDS beat the state to it. In many ways, he targeted victims like John Wayne Gacy. He targeted those in the LGBTQ community, they were at higher risk of being victimized. Where Gacy used a business to entice others, Eiler picked up hitchhikers. Because of the circumstances, it let these men continue operating for far too long. We owe the finding of Bill's name, in this case, to Redgrave Research Forensic Services, which is located in Massachusetts. The police in Indiana tried to match Bill with his name, but they couldn't do it, and DNA was the only way this case would ever be solved. Despite confessing to the murder, Eiler was unable or unwilling to provide a name or other relevant information. Eventually, in building a genetic tree, it led to requesting a DNA sample from Bill's sibling, which would go on to confirm his identity. His nephew spoke for the family, saying he would be buried next to his father in Peru, who passed away without ever knowing what happened to his son. Bill's nephew, Joshua, told reporters that he was told by his dad that the mob got Bill, saying he thinks it was a joke, but he's not actually sure. Bill's mother never did accept the idea that Bill might not be alive anymore. She insisted he was still out there somewhere. Over the years, his nephew asked what his uncle was like. His family said he played football in high school, and he was a quiet guy who kept to himself. Bill Lewis went unidentified for 38 years. The Tiger Lady, identified as Wendy Louise Baker. For 30 years, Wendy Louise Baker was missing from Coltsville, Pennsylvania, but her family always believed she ran away and was just living her life elsewhere. It never occurred to them that she was no longer alive. The truth was not what they wanted. They had always hoped she would just choose to come home. Instead, Wendy had been found on October 26, 1991, in Knowlton Township, New Jersey. She was buried a hundred miles away, and it took 30 years and one month for her to get her name back. The New Jersey police found themselves unable to discover very little regarding the woman they nicknamed the Tiger Lady. She had a large tattoo of a tiger on her left calf. They knew she had dirty blonde or light brown hair, but they didn't even know if that was her natural color. They knew she had an overbite, and her left ear had four piercings. Her cause of death couldn't be determined, although how and where she was found indicates somebody took her life. She was found near the Interstate 80 rest stop near Knowlton Township in New Jersey, tossed away without clothing, as if she didn't deserve a second thought. But the truth is that she mattered to a lot of people, despite the effort that was made to hide her identity. In fact, she mattered so much to the New Jersey detectives working on her case, they began sending representatives to tattoo conventions all over the U.S., They'd hoped to find the artist who created the tattoo, and that might lead to her name. 
Wendy was actually one of two does in the area, and in 2018, they began a hardcore search for the names of both women. The other woman, Princess Doe, still remains unsolved. As hard as they tried, it was once again DNA that closed the case. We owe this identification to Bode Technology, who teamed up with the Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They built her family tree, eventually leading back to her grandparents, Ernest Baker and Nina Brownwell. Both were deceased, but they were the link that they needed. It took months, but it eventually led to her uncle, Desi Baker. It turns out that Wendy's family was large. In fact, she had 16 aunts and uncles on her father's side alone. And over the years, aunts, uncles, cousins, they would find themselves thinking of her and wondering what happened. Her uncle explained they always considered her status choosing to go quiet. Desi mentioned that he always had a feeling that she was in Ohio, just living her best life, and they always hoped that she'd come home someday. Maybe with kids in tow, ready to reconnect with the family that missed her so much. It never occurred to anyone she was no longer alive, much less buried as a Jane Doe for so many years. Sadly, both of Wendy's parents passed away without ever finding out what happened to her. Her mother passed away in 1999, and her father 16 years later, in 2015. Her family describes Wendy as someone who bounced from place to place, so it wasn't even out of character for her to run away. There's no indication why, but Wendy didn't live with her parents when she went missing. She instead lived with her stepmother, and in the telling, it appears she was raised with the stepmother from age 4 to 15, and this is when she went missing. There's no indication whether or not her stepmother is still alive. While Wendy lived mainly in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, she also lived in Brenton, Florida, and frequently visited California. She had a love of travel in her blood, and it was a surprise she was only 113 miles away from home all that time. In the middle of researching, they realized they had her father's DNA on file all the time. They were eventually able to use this compared with the DNA uploaded from Wendy to confirm that she was, in fact, his daughter. It's unclear if it was run through CODIS, which, if it had been, might have given her identity faster. It does highlight just how different the path to identification can be. But as a country, we've come a long way, and we have databases that work to aid in searches like this. Wendy's death is still a mystery, and if anyone out there has any idea of her movements from 1990 to 1991, please call the number on your screen. She was 15 when she disappeared from her stepmother's home, and 16 when she was found, so there is a gap of information on this case. At this time, authorities have no leads on any suspects in her murder. Their investigation remains active, and anyone who has any information, please call the number on your screen. You can also call an anonymous tip into Crime Stoppers. Wendy Louise Baker went unidentified for 30 years. Yonkers Jane Doe, identified as Marissa Hammonds. So often, the person or persons who took the lives and identities of John and Jane Doe's remain a mystery. But in the case of Marissa Hammonds, we know who committed the crime and why. But the most important part, the thing that maybe matters the most, is her name and who she was. And that mystery continued for 29 years. Only two years short of the life Marissa lived in the first place. Marissa was 31, and a serial named Robert Shulman took her life. He eventually admitted to the police that he brought her back to his apartment and they did crack. For a while, he claimed that he blacked out, and when he awoke, she was no longer alive. He said he cut her apart and put her in an alley where she was found, in hopes of hiding his crime. In reality, he was a postal worker from Long Island, and it wasn't the first time he'd taken someone's life. In fact, she was one of at least five people, he finally passed away in prison of an undisclosed illness. The part that always matters to me the most is who she was. Carl Koppelman's image of her with a cigarette is one I've seen many times. I remember reading that she was a heavy smoker, and like so many of Carl's images, he tried to encompass what little was known in order to create a picture someone may recognize. It was on Carl's Facebook page, in fact, where I learned that Marissa again had her name. Up to this point, where she was publicly identified in December of 2021, little was known about her. Shulman eventually confessed to the crime, but if he knew her more or knew more information about her, he didn't provide it. Marissa had a butterfly tattoo on her right shoulder, 
that authorities had hoped would lead to her identity, but it never did. They knew that she had brown hair and hazel eyes. They also knew she had given birth at least twice. She had two C-section scars. One was a vertical C-section and another a transverse. It's possible her fingerprints might have led to a name, but Shulman took away that chance as her hands couldn't be identified. They believed her to be 28 to 42 years old. Her sister and one of her sons commented on Carl Koppelman's post to share their appreciation for finally knowing what happened to Marissa. Detective John Geis from the Yonkers Police Department arrived in person to let them know what happened. She shared how respectful and humble the officer was. Her son Jason shared how much his mother will always be missed, but that she was very loved and can now rest in peace. But the stunning part of what he wrote was that he didn't know his mother's family and that the knowledge of her identity brought to him a family he never had before. This makes me think that her boys were adopted out. He shared that he loves every single one of the Hammonds family that are back in his life. As sad as all of this is, it is pretty amazing that something so wonderful came from it. It's unclear how she came to the crossroads of where she was. At the time of her death, she was working on the streets. Whether it was circumstances, drugs, or whatever put her in that place, it was just a bloop in time. She deserved a chance to turn it all around, and that chance was stolen from her. Before that blip in time, she was a happy young woman who lived most of her childhood in California, although she was born in Kentucky in 1961, one of seven children. Her family eventually moved to New Jersey, where Marissa worked with her sisters as a model. She had family who loved her and never stopped missing her. Shulman died in prison back in 2006. California ruled his death sentence to be cruel and unusual punishment, and it was commuted to a life in prison. Two years after his life was saved by this technicality, he passed away from an undisclosed illness, a quiet ending for someone who stole from five other women the chance to have their own quiet ending. Marissa Hammonds went unidentified for 29 years. Thanks everyone for watching and listening. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe button. We have new episodes every Monday and Thursday. And don't forget, life can change on a dime. So take care of yourselves and each other.